Ladies and gentlemen, for tonight's keynote address, I'd like to welcome Dan Adler to the stage. Dan is a longtime friend, member of the Wild Sheep Foundation, an exhibitor, a donor, and a speaker for us. Dan is a former maintenance officer and pilot in the United States Air Force. And today, he, along with his wife, Terry, owns and operates one of the largest elk and coos deer outfits in the Southwest, Diamond Outfitters of Arizona. Dan is also the co-host of Pulse Factor TV, which airs on the Pursuit Channel. Here to deliver a piece entitled, Hunting Equals Patriotism, please welcome my friend, good friend, Dan Adler. Thank you. Thank you, Gray, for that introduction and for all your team does for the Wild Sheep Foundation and this wonderful fraternity of international mountain hunters. I have to open up with a brief story. I was flying here yesterday from Tucson, and I had a brief layover in Las Vegas. And as many of you know, there was some delays yesterday due to weather on the East Coast that affected flights all throughout the country. So as I was running to catch my connection to Reno, I about bowled over this gal who about bowled over me. And fortunately, we both stopped in time not to hit each other. And I looked up and noticed right away that it was Nancy Pelosi. And she, yeah. She had an entourage with her of some well-dressed young folks, and she looked at my shirt, and I happened to be wearing my Wild Sheep Foundation shirt, and she kind of tilted her head. I could see she was really concentrating, and she said, the Wild Sheep Foundation, what's that? I said, well, ma'am, it's an internationally respected hunting and conservation organization whose mission is to put and keep sheep on the mountain. And they are an ardent and steadfast supporter of the Second Amendment. Thank you. She tilted her head again. I could see she was really thinking hard. And she said, the Second Amendment, what's that? <laughs> Gray, it is truly humbling uh, and one of the greatest professional honors of my life to be speaking with all of you. Many of you who are my hunting mentors and friends on a subject that aside from my family are the two most important things in my life. My love for my country and my passion for hunting. I know we are blessed to have a large international audience here tonight. And I know I'm surrounded by patriots and hunters from around the world. Welcome to the first of four incredible nights at the 2014 Wild Sheep Foundation Convention. As Gray mentioned, thank you, the, as Gray mentioned, the title of my dialogue with you tonight is Hunting Equals Patriotism. And I want to share with you, in my own words, how your love for hunting, your love for mountain and sheep hunting, and your love for hunting around the world is one of the most important celebrations of freedom a patriot can do for his or her country. For when you're hunting in the field, whether you know it or not, you are celebrating freedom. You are honoring your nation's service members, veterans, and those that have fallen. Allow me to explain. In March of 2001, I was on top of the world. I had just sewn on captain at Langley Air Force Base near Hampton, Virginia, finally shedding the Lieutenant Dan nickname made popular by the movie Forrest Gump after I lived with that for four long years. I had also just fulfilled a lifelong goal of obtaining my private pilot's license and to really, really top it off, I had just drawn a trophy archery bull elk tag in my home state of Arizona. Let me tell you, at age 24, it doesn't get any better than that. Fast forward six months. It was a gorgeous, clear, cool and crisp September day on the flight line at the fighting first fighter wing at Langley. I was three days away from flying home from my elk hunt. I was the flight commander for the first CRS avionics flight, where we were largely responsible for maintaining the advanced radar system of the F-15 Eagle for three of the world's most elite combat-coded fighter squadrons. A little after 8 a.m., one of my flight chiefs, flight chiefs reported to me that some idiot had just flown an airplane into one of the Twin Towers at the World Trade Center. Being so close to New York City, I knew what the weather was like that day, and I knew being a new pilot, 
hitting one of those towers on such a clear day was nearly impossible. When I went to the break room, I looked on the screen to see the image that is burned into all freedom-loving people's memories. I saw the tower engulfed in flames. I saw the size of the fire. And I knew this was no Cessna, this was no Piper Cub, and that something was terribly wrong. Before I could gather my thoughts or even say anything to my troops, the second airplane hit right in front of my eyes. I knew then that our world and the lives of all freedom-loving people would never be the same. As we got word from NORAD to generate 24 F-15s for an immediate launch to search and, if necessary, destroy our own civilian aircraft, I did not have the time or the luxury to feel any emotions. We were at war right now, and we only had minutes to generate, arm, and launch our Eagles. Later that evening, I addressed both my day shift and swing shift for the first time as, as an officer in a non-training environment. This was real. We were at war. We didn't know what it meant. We really didn't know in the initial hours for sure who was responsible or why this was done. I just knew, we all knew, that it was go time. I will tell you now, and very humbly admit, I am so grateful to this day that my mother, sister, and godfather called me that day, putting their own tears aside, knowing instinctively that as a patriot, my heart would be broken, reminding me that my troops couldn't see me break down, and for giving me the strength to do my job well. That night, like all of you in this room, I didn't sleep at all. I watched the news until I really don't know when. The next morning, I left my apartment for Langley two hours before usual. I was seeking my boss, Captain Conrad Cody. I had a strange suspicion he would be at work too, and I was right. I sat down on a chair near his desk, my voice almost trembling, and said, Sir, where are we going, and how soon do we leave? In my mind, there was no doubt I would be deploying before the week ended. And to be truthful, I couldn't wait. Captain Cody said, so far, we're going to maintain the combat air patrols, what we called CAPS, around New York City and Washington, D.C. This operation would later be dubbed Operation Noble Eagle and said that our airframe, at least thus far, was not being called upon to deploy. You see, our version of the F-15 had an air-to-air -air combat role only, and our suspected attackers didn't have an Air Force. I remember saying something about, well, you can send me on any airframe. We have to do something. I remember him almost smiling and saying, I already had you as number one on the volunteer list. He knew me well. I went back to my shop, dejected, even disappointed in knowing that despite being assigned to the singularly most feared airplane in the world by our enemies, that my team's number hadn't been called. I spent the next day or so with my troops, generating those cap sorties and int attending intelligence briefings. It was amazing to me to watch our war machine work. And like so many of you, I was inspired by our president, who stood on the burning rubble in New York City and promised to the world, although I would have sworn he was looking in my eyes and talking to me, when he said, soon the men who brought these buildings down would be hearing from us all. On Friday, the 14th, Captain Cody summoned me into his office. I thought, here we go. Coach is putting me in the game. When I got there, he didn't want to talk about deploying at all. He said, Dan, didn't your leave for your elk hunt start yesterday? He was a hunter too. I said, yes, sir. He said, Dan, you need to take this leave. After all, you're number one on the go list. I said, sir, I don't understand. He said, look, it doesn't look like we're going anywhere imminently. And if you don't go hunt, and then you later deploy, you've gained nothing, and the terrorists win. I said, excuse me, sir? He said, if the terrorists know they've altered your life, altered your passion, altered your plans, then they win and freedom loses. Go hunt, he said. Hunt hard. Do it for the fallen, and come back ready to kick some ass, because the terrorists cannot think for a moment 
that they are changing the way we live or the way we celebrate freedom. I went back to my shop and told my chief what Captain Cody said. I was feeling a little awkward and even uncomfortable. My chief had been in the United States Air Force for longer than I had been alive. He was a hunter too. He said, Cap, I agree you should go. They can't alter freedom at any level. I went to that afternoon's intelligence briefing and when I got back, Chief Sol told me something I'll never forget so long as I live. Cap, he said, grab your stuff. You leave in five hours. I said, I don't think so, Gary. Norfolk International is still closed. He said, I know. The airline just called the shop. You're flying out of BWI in three hours, and I'm going to drive you. It was an awkward and inspiring moment. The smoke was still billowing over New York City, Pennsylvania, and the Pentagon, and I was going hunting. I double-checked with the airline that I could change my ticket back to Virginia if I got the call. I hunted in Arizona about seven days. They never called me in. Over the next 18 months, however, we did have the opportunity to deploy both to Asia and Europe in support of Operation Enduring Freedom. And I'm forever grateful that my troops and I were able to make even the most minuscule contribution. I worked with the most amazing men and women. In July of 2002, I was reassigned to Davis Monthan Air Force Base in Tucson. There I was the sortie generation flight commander for the 354th Fighter Squadron Bulldogs, serving on the A-10 aircraft. For those of you not familiar with the A-10, it is nicknamed the Tank Buster, or the Warthog. It is designed to fly low and slow over enemy targets. In addition to a large array of missiles, bombs, and rockets, it has a 30 millimeter cannon on the nose that is so fierce, my ammo troops routinely wore a t-shirt that said, you can run, but you'll just die tired. Finally, I had been assigned to an airframe with high demand in a desert campaign. I was so excited to be assigned to this jet. In late March of 2003, just nine months after my arrival to the 354th, Operation Iraqi Freedom, or Iraq II as we called it, began with the shock and awe campaign over Baghdad. You know, it's really strange how the world turns. As my great-grandmother used to say, man makes plans and God laughs. You see, early the next month, my fiance and I were to be married. So here we go again, bombs on target, we're in a new campaign, and I'm supposed to be married in two weeks. Welcome to a military family, I thought for my bride to be. A local newspaper was doing a spot on military weddings and they decided to interview me by a phone out of a Phoenix office. Now I could tell pretty early in the dialogue which direction the reporter leaned politically, but that was no surprise. In any case, she asked me, and I quote, is the wedding still on with a breakout of war? There was almost a judgmental tone in her voice, insinuating that I was doing something dishonorable by celebrating during a time of armed combat. It brought me back to the Captain Cody conversation less than two years prior. I simply told her, yes, ma'am, the bad guys win if we alter our dreams and plans. Wouldn't the terrorists be tickled to know we were all canceling our weddings back home? I wouldn't give them any such pleasure, neither would my fiance. The reporter was taken back by my response a little bit, I think. Maybe it was just my tone. What she didn't know, what I couldn't disclose to her, was that my six-month deployment was already on the schedule in the coming weeks. We were bringing 18 more A-10s to Kandahar and Bagram, and hell was coming with us. I cannot tell you over the years how many soldiers, Marines, airmen, and special operation heroes of mine have told me over the years how the arrival of an A-10 overhead in combat turned the tides of a particular battle or even saved their lives. It's an amazing platform. I thank God for the engineers that drew up the warthog and the pilots that drive it. My wife Terry and I did marry on April 12th of 2003. 
It was a beautiful event with full military honors. So long as I live, I will never forget crossing under the sabers of the Air Force Color Guard with my new bride. That evening, our wedding reception took place at the Officers Club. The reception included the color, color Guard as well. And we set an empty table for one to honor our missing in action and killed in action. The Color Guard performed the impressive table for one ceremony and there was hardly a dry eye in the room. Because the news that day was a buzz with the capture of several Americans in Nasiraya, Iraq, including Jessica Lynch, Soshana Johnson, and several others. We took a moment right then and there with all our family and friends at our own wedding to say a prayer for the release. Imagine the blessing we felt the next morning when we learned that several of the POWs from that battle had been released in largely good health. It was the first successful release of POWs since Vietnam. And for Lori and Shoshana, it was the first ever for a woman in our country's history. You see, hunting truly does equal patriotism. Most of us here are hunters. All of us here love our freedom. And all of us here love our respective countries. Sometimes when we are hunting, we get hung up on our egos and things like gross score, net score, the age and trophy class of our animals. Heck, as an outfitter and guide, I'm guilty of this all the time. But then I sit around the campfire and I look up at the sky and I take a deep breath and I look at the people I'm with, my friends, my clients, new and old, and I am reminded I am participating in a hunt. I am participating in a time-honored tradition that goes back as far as human existence. I am celebrating freedom, a right given to humans, and if you ask me, a right given to all of us by God, a right not to be interfered with by anyone. And when we hunt, we honor freedom. We honor our right to be part of a natural equation that non-hunters simply will never understand. When I served, I never felt like I was serving my congressmen or senators. I wasn't serving red tape or politics of any kind. No disrespect intended, but I was serving those brothers and sisters that had already served our country and the airmen by my side first, then my family, friends, neighbors, my religion, my right to be free, and the world I wanted my children to inherit. And you know what? And this is really important. In my circles, when we deployed, the only things we talked about day after day was our family, our friends, and our passion for hunting. That's it. That's all. That's what kept us going. Talking about our favorite deer stand, our favorite elk call, or our glorious proclamation, even if false, that this was the year, finally, we would draw an Arizona bighorn desert sheep tag. Today when I fly over this great nation, I look down and I see those wide open spaces below. I know elk, deer, sheep, and other life, wildlife roam. Well, you know what? We serve them too. Without a doubt, we are proud to serve and protect our wild animals. As you know, it is only hunters that step up to do this time and time again. As we all know too well, hunting is under threat globally. Thanks to so many of you in this room, my friends, the situation is improving internationally. But we must continue to win the day-to-day -day battles to ultimately win that war. I am so blessed to be able to speak to you and this fraternity at conventions like this around the country. And there is one question I often get from so many of you. How can I best say thank you to a vet? Many of you already do so many wonderful things. You buy a drink or a meal for a service member when you see one in a restaurant. Many of you have given a high five or shaken the hand of a service member when you pass them at the airport. Many of you acknowledge them, as we did tonight, by having them stand and be recognized at events, nationally, and at home at your local banquets, or in fundraisers, or you give them a special pin or raffle item. Some of you, even by hunts, tags, licenses, and airplane flights, as is the case with this wild sheep family. When two years ago, you sent Sergeant Greg Stubbe to hunt coos deer with me in Arizona. 
You honored us both so much by doing that. And to this day, Greg and I are dearest and most respected friends. So if you sometimes find yourself struggling with ways to show appreciation for our service members, our veterans, know this, we're not looking for a thank you. We're not looking for accolades. But for the most part, service members love the outdoors. We love to hunt. We love to mountain hunt. And we love to hear your stories of our fellow hunters. So if you really, really want to thank us at the highest level, go hunting. Take a kid with you. Take someone hunting for the first time. Mentor them. Tell them that hunting celebrates freedom and honors our service members and vets. Go hunt, hunt hard, have fun, and live a big, big, giant life. Because, at least for this vet, that's what I fought for, and that is my wish for all of you. God bless you and your families. God stay with all of us in our fight to protect the right to hunt and fish. I hope to see all of you on the mountain. Good night. Thank you, Captain. Inspirational words. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you do. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause for Dan Adler.